If you like to listen to audiobooks to learn new things, but you don't have a lot of free time on your hands, stick around to the end of the show because today's sponsor, Blinkist, is exactly what you need. working on a new drink just for this episode just for bills fans kind of a spicy alternate version of a whiskey sour with some frank's red hot sauce in there too because again it's buffalo how can you not have frank's i was kind of racking my brain for a name for this drink for a really long time uh, until eventually one hit me that i felt was pretty appropriate so say hello to Poncho's Revenge. Viva Los Bills, buddy. Rest in peace. I want to talk about Josh Allen this week, and specifically this game against the Chiefs on Sunday, because this matchup to me is extremely fascinating, and I think that it could and potentially will go far, far differently than the first matchup, where the Bills lost to the Chiefs on a cold, rainy Monday evening up in Buffalo. When you look back at that first meeting, honestly, a lot of things were working against the Bills that day. Josh Allen was playing through a nagging shoulder injury. Trey White, John Brown, and Tremaine Edmonds were all playing hurt as well. Matt Milano, who was arguably the team's most important defensive player this year, and you can back that up with numbers just when you look at their production with and without him this season, he didn't suit up either because he was hurt too. That roster was really beat up in the first half of the season. And so, in my opinion, because of all those injuries, that Chiefs game took on a similar theme to a lot of the other games that we saw the Bills struggle in this year, and that's Josh Allen being forced to take on the world all by himself. We saw that happen far too much this past year, where either the Buffalo defense would struggle, or they would have almost zero run game to speak of, or both. And all of the Bills' hopes and dreams would then have to rest on Allen's right arm and Stephon Diggs' feet. And don't get me wrong, there were plenty of games where they did make that work just because Allen and all his receivers are so damn good. For instance, they beat the Seahawks while their running backs rushed for a grand total of 19 yards. But against the Chiefs specifically, that formula of bad run game, bad defense, and elite quarterback play didn't work because the Chiefs beat them with well-rounded, team-oriented, complementary football. And we saw that especially play out with how the Chiefs' defense meticulously game planned to contain Allen. Now, before we get into all this nitty-gritty defensive scheme talk and what the Chiefs did specifically to hold Allen to only 122 yards passing in that game, I first want to break down all of the main tendencies in the Bills' offense because I kind of feel like you need to get a full picture of what Buffalo was trying to do this year so that you can understand what Kansas City was trying to plan against. Buffalo uses 11 personnel, meaning one back, one tight end, and three wide receivers 77% of the time which is a huge number and the highest percentage in the league of just using that one personnel grouping. The only other teams that even came close to them in the regular season were Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. And on top of that, perhaps because their offense is so pass heavy and wide receiver centric, they tended to throw it deep early and often, with Allen's average depth of target being 8.9 yards per next gen stats, which among starting quarterbacks in the league was the eighth highest average in the NFL. Now, strangely, despite all that reliance on the passing game, Buffalo does not use a lot of pre-snap motion in this system like many other cutting-edge modern offenses. It's pretty much a set-it-and-forget-it type offense unless Allen changes a play at the line, and then there might be a motion just to get into that new play. But overall, this offense is 28th in the league in motion usage rate per pro football focus, which is pretty damn low. The only teams lower than them this year were the Chargers, Giants, Eagles, and ironically, the Cardinals. On the positive side of modern offensive trends though, the Bills are also 8th in early down pass frequency at 54.8%. 
meaning on over half of their early down plays, they're throwing the ball, not running it. Probably because they suck at running the ball, as I said before, but because they use that modern air raid style approach and pass the ball so much on those early downs, they still end up being really good in terms of average yards to go on third down. They are ranked 10th best in the league in that category, with only 6.6 .6 yards to go on average on third down. Now, because Buffalo's third downs are typically pretty manageable distances, relative to the rest of the league at least, their third down conversion rate is also a leap, all the way up at 48.5%, which is fourth in the NFL. So not only is their offense explosive vertically, but it's also efficient at moving the chains and extending drives as well. Beyond that, what we also know about Buffalo at this point is that Josh Allen absolutely shreds single high safety coverage structures. If you play anything in the cover one or cover three family of coverages, odds are he's going to destroy you. And a big reason for that is the Bills' reliance on crossing routes, drag routes, and deep over routes, which are all great against those single high safety structures. Those kinds of routes can easily cross the safety's face deep down the field while that safety has to worry about covering both seam areas simultaneously. And often there's little to nothing that that safety can do to stop those deep crosses from getting open. Statistically speaking, Allen's numbers against single high coverages are just absolutely jaw dropping because of that weakness. I'm talking 67% completions, over 2,700 yards through the air, eight and a half yards per attempt, 20 touchdowns to only five picks, and 21 sacks on those 350 total dropbacks, which is about a 5.9% sack rate, which honestly isn't bad. Among quarterbacks with at least 100 attempts versus single high safety coverages this year, that is third in yards, fifth in touchdowns, fifth in completion percentage, fourth in yards per attempt, tied with Aaron Rodgers, and sixth in passer rating. Now, wrapping up this little monologue here, we also know that the Bills are the fifth ranked offensive line in the league in adjusted sack rate allowed at only 4.8%, meaning only 4.8% of their dropbacks result in a sack. And part of that is because they don't leave their offensive line alone to fend for themselves all the time. Buffalo is fifth in the league in terms of frequency of running six or seven man pass protection schemes. They do that about 34% of the time. And on those heavier pass protections, Allen holds the ball for an average of just over three seconds, which is a long time, relatively speaking. He's thrown 15 touchdowns and only two picks on plays with six or more pass protectors, whether that's a running back, a tight end, or even both staying back in protection. And he's got over 1,400 yards from those plays as well, which is also sixth in the league. Overall, if you want to know what the Bills' offensive identity really is, rolled into one hypothetical perfect play, it's a three wide receiver set, a six or seven man pass protection scheme off play action, so that of course Josh Allen can hold the ball for an eternity, and then he'll throw a deep crossing route against single high safety coverage to Stephon Diggs or whoever else happens to be open, which knowing the Bills realistically is their entire receiving core, that is typically their dream scenario. And on a week to week basis, they do whatever they can to live out that dream scenario as many times as possible. Which, of course, brings us full circle back to that Chiefs game, because KC, knowing full well all of that information that I just rattled off, did everything in their power to not play within Josh Allen's comfort zone. Specifically, they played in two high safety coverages 65% of the time, which normally they only do at 60%, so that's a pretty notable jump, and they did that because they wanted to take away the deep crossing routes at all costs that Allen lives off of, and they wanted to force the Bills to either try to run the ball or to dink and dunk their way down the field to just get yards, both of which kind of run counter to their aggressive deep ball mentality. And in addition to those two high safety coverages, while the Chiefs did blitz a lot in that game, which again would normally play into Allen's hands because he's exceptional against blitzes, they ran those numerous pressures with tons of disguises and came at Allen from a bunch of different angles so that he never really knew how to set his protections. Keep in mind that Allen's touchdown to interception ratio against blitzes this year was astronomically high at 18 TDs to two picks, 
And a big reason for that efficiency, of course, was that reliance on those six or seven man pass protections that I mentioned earlier. Those extra bodies up front allowed Buffalo to handle the extra rushers so that Josh could just sit in the pocket all day long and throw darts deep down the field. So, from a defensive philosophy standpoint, if you are a blitz-happy defense like Kansas City, going up against an offense that likes to use lots of heavier protections like Buffalo, there's really only one way to still blitz effectively and get rushers free into the backfield, and that is disguise and misdirection. KC was able to use Disguise to get some really good pressure early in that game, usually by showing them rotating a lot from a one high safety look pre-snap into a two high safety look post-snap, again to take away those deep crossing routes as I said, and then eventually those post-snap coverage rotations over and over and over again would lull Josh Allen into sort of a false sense of security so that eventually they would not rotate for once and instead bring that pressure, which at times would slip through the protection immediately. It wasn't until about halfway into the second quarter and onward that we really started to see Allen lean on hard counts to try to get Kansas City to show what they were doing and of course to tip off their blitzes so that he could then make adjustments at the line and get into a better play against those blitz looks. That worked multiple times for him, and ironically, Allen identifying two key blitzes pre-snap in that game is what set up both of his eventual touchdown passes. But to me, honestly, Buffalo's main problems from that week six matchup had nothing to do with Kansas City's coverages or any of their exotic blitzes, and it had everything to do with Josh Allen once again trying to take on the whole world by himself, and you could also say that it had a lot to do with the team around Josh Allen flat out having a bad day. For starters, you could see multiple times in that game that Allen really wanted to push the ball down the field, especially in third down situations, and he was completely ignoring his checkdowns to the flats that had huge catch and run opportunities. The Chiefs knew that Allen tends to press a lot and he can get very impatient as a passer sometimes because he's just trying so hard to make a play. It's probably one of his only few remaining flaws at this point, and they exploited that lack of patience and basically let him have whatever he wanted underneath because they knew that he probably wouldn't check it down underneath anyway. Hell, it wasn't until about midway through the fourth quarter that we really started to see Allen get in rhythm against these two high safety shells, and he marched right down the field with a bunch of smart, conservative throws into the soft spots in those zones. And by the way, in that series, which started with about nine minutes left in the game, he went five for five for 56 yards and a touchdown, all on that one drive that covered only two and a half minutes of game clock. He was surgical against that zone defense once he figured out what they were doing to him, but unfortunately for Buffalo, it was too little too late. KC ate up four and a half minutes of clock and all three of the Bills timeouts on their ensuing field goal drive that turned it back into a two possession game at nine points. And they even ran that possession under the two minute warning so that the Bills had literally no way to stop the clock. That desperate situation that Kansas City created for him sent Allen right back into that hero ball mode that always gets him into so much trouble. On Allen's final pass of the night, which was that game ceiling interception, the Chiefs were in basic quarters coverage and literally abandoned the flats, basically just saying, all right, Josh, throw it here and we'll give it to you, just don't go deep. But Allen predictably ignored that. He wanted to be a superhero once again, because he kind of had to be. And because of that desperation, he tried to fit a ball in where he really shouldn't have. It got picked by Dan Sorensen and that was that, game over. There's a famous quote from Vince Lombardi that reads, we didn't lose the game, we just ran out of time, and I'll be damned if there isn't a better quote to describe that game between Buffalo and KC. Josh Allen, believe it or not, did figure out that Chiefs defense by the fourth quarter, but the problem is that he barely had the ball. The Bills' run defense, at least at that point in the season, was so bad that they allowed Kansas City to run all over them to the tune of 244 yards on the ground, and in the second half alone, the Bills' time of possession was only 6 minutes and 41 seconds to over 23 minutes for the Chiefs. Before that touchdown drive late in the game, Allen only got to run 7 plays in that whole half. He straight up barely even got to play, and that's because the team around him, again at that time, was not helping him out. 
I mean, it's no wonder that Allen put up terrible overall numbers when the other team held the ball for almost twice as long as he did throughout that game. I don't know how many quarterbacks in history could win under those circumstances, but it's probably not many. So credit to Kansas City at least for doing that to Buffalo and for coming up with a great game plan for keeping Allen off the field for as long as possible. However, I will say this, in the rematch coming up this weekend, I don't think that that same game plan from Kansas City would work again a second time. At this point in the year, I would argue that the supporting cast around Allen is as healthy and is as good as it's ever been. Matt Milano in particular is fully back and healthy and playing at his usual Pro Bowl level, and I would personally argue that he is the most impactful defensive player on that entire defense. Buffalo is undefeated on the season when Milano is in the starting lineup, and there's a reason for that. With Milano, their rushing yards allowed per game goes from 28th to 9th, their passing yards allowed per game goes from 27th to 5th, their average first downs allowed jumps from 31st to 8th, and their points per game allowed improves from 29th to 2nd in the entire league. Why is there such a massive improvement when Milano's on the field? Well, I'll save that for another episode in the future because he does deserve his own show by himself. But suffice to say, over the last half of the season when Buffalo got Milano and Edmonds and John Feliciano and Dawson Knox and all of these other players back healthy and performing well, all of a sudden the Bills went from being essentially a one-man show to being an actual semi-well-rounded football team. And when the Bills are capable of playing good team football around their elite quarterback, they are damn near unbeatable. Does this team still have a few very notable flaws? I mean, yeah, sure, duh, like they're not perfect. They still can't run the ball worth a damn and they haven't been able to do that all year long, so that's no surprise. But by no means is this such a drastic mismatch of supporting casts like it was all the way back in week six. The Bills are legitimately a much better team now, and to me that makes them by far the most dangerous opponent the KC will play against this year. Honestly, I don't know what's going to happen this weekend. Playoff football is unpredictable as it is, but when you factor in that this game has two of the most explosive quarterbacks in the entire league, backed up by two of the most explosive receiving cores in the entire league, I really cannot confidently pick either way. All I do know is this, regardless of who you think is going to win in this championship rematch, whether it's Kansas City or Buffalo, just make sure that you do one thing for me. Bet the over. Thank you for watching this week's episode, and also thank you to our sponsor for the week, Blinkist. Blinkist is a huge library of over 3,000 condensed nonfiction books on everything from career development to organization to economics and science. And when I say condensed, I mean condensed. Each blink is only about 12 to 15 minutes long and summarizes the main ideas and information from each book into more convenient and digestible pieces. Kind of like the videos that you see on this channel that distill 60 to 70 hours of research and work down to about a 15 minute episode that gets the main point across. I listen to one or two blinks every morning while I'm in the shower and getting ready for the day. Just this past week, for instance, I listened to Happy Money by Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton because one of my New Year's resolutions was to not spend my money as stupidly as I did in 2020. I mean, to be fair, I definitely thought the Texans would win more than five games, so I thought that was an easy bet, but... Anyway, not going to do that anymore, and I find that blinks are a great way to quickly learn some new things or gain some new perspectives on things like money that I didn't really have before. Plus, if I want to go more in-depth into any particular idea I get on Blinkist, I can just buy the full book and read it or listen to it whenever I want to. You can get one free Blink per day on the Blinkist app, or if you really like the service and you want to try the premium version for unlimited Blinks per day, the first 100 people to click on the link in the description down below will get unlimited access for one week to try it out, and you will get 25% off the full membership if you decide you want to buy it. That 7-day trial is completely free, and you can cancel it at any time during that period if you don't think it's for you. So if you're interested in learning some new things and broadening your horizons without having to read dozens of books for hundreds of hours, check out Blinkist and see if you like it. 